Today's show is brought to you by Cobra Head. From lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com, this is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Mark Highland, the organic mechanic, is back on the show today, and we're talking about practical organic gardening. Mark is the owner and operator of the Organic Mechanic Soil Company. When it comes to building healthy soil, Mark is a master. He has taught classes at Longwood Gardens, the Tyler Arboretum, Mount Cuba Center, Callaway Gardens, and the Scott Arboretum, just to name a few. He has served as a consultant for the EPA and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and he recently received the Young Professional Award from the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. As Mark often points out, there are a lot of benefits to organic gardening, and it's not just about the quality of the food. Certainly, organic gardeners have a strong connection to their garden and their property, but they also care deeply about the natural world. There's an oft-used idiom to describe starting with the basics, foundation, or fundamentals, and it's from the ground up. From the ground up implies thoroughness, completeness, and strength. When it comes to organic gardening, the starting point is literally from the ground up, and the focus begins with the soil. By building healthy soil that is loaded with organic matter, nutrients, and microbial activity, you can stop using the synthetic fertilizers and pesticides used in conventional gardening. If you're new to gardening, or if you've been a conventional gardener all your life using sprays and pesticides, rest assured you can be an organic gardener too. That transition doesn't need to be overwhelming. Just take baby steps. When it comes to gardening, everyone is learning. No one knows it all. When it comes to making a change, Just remember that organic gardening is a paradigm, and it takes a while to shift a paradigm. Practical Organic Gardening Explained, plus how to solve garden challenges naturally with Mark Highland. That's the topic of today's show, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. Well, welcome to the show, everyone. It's good to be back. Thank you for listening to the show. If you've just found the show, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. Many people find the show simply by searching for gardening podcasts. So if you're in that camp, welcome. I'm so happy that you found us. And I also encourage people to listen to many different gardening podcasts because as I discovered five years ago, it's such a wonderful way to grow and learn as a gardener. This past week, I listened to a couple of different episodes I wanted to draw your attention to. The first is the Joe Gardner podcast. He had an episode that came out recently that was called Organizing Your Garden Life. And I love shows like this because I love to geek out on tech. I think I have over 500 apps on my iPad, and I use a lot of wonderful tech tools like Text Expander and Evernote, just to name a few. And so Joe had a lot of the apps that I also use on the show, but then I also learned about a few others, and it's always fun to do that because just when you think there couldn't possibly be another app that you need, you find out about an, yet another one. So it's it's great to find out those things. Then over at the On the Ledge podcast with Jane Perrone, her episode 44 that just came out is featuring houseplant trends that were featured at the Garden Museum. That was a fun episode. Here in Minnesota, we're still covered in many, many inches of snow. And so houseplants are still taking front and center in terms of my attention and time. Plus, I love listening to episodes about houseplants. I always learn something new. And houseplants just really make a house a home, in my opinion. So great show by Jane Perrone. Great show by Joe the Gardener. Check both those out. 
And in the meantime, I'm sincerely honored that you're spending some time here listening to the Still Growing Podcast. As I just mentioned, there was a ton of snow that has fallen in Maple Grove. In fact, this past weekend, we got the highest snowfall amounts in the entire state of Minnesota. We got 22 inches. It was totally crazy to watch this and very scary to drive in. The boys were at a basketball game about a half an hour from our home. And I was just so grateful that Phil was driving us home because we were in the middle of this blizzard. We really had no business staying for this last game. But they finally closed the school. We got in the truck and we were driving home and it was just one of those rides you just never forget because it was blowing so hard. There was just so much snow and we definitely wouldn't have made it home without four-wheel drive. But when I got home... After the snow was done falling and it took about 18 hours for us to get all of that snow, I looked out on the deck and all I could see were the tippy tops of my basil that had bolted in my planters on the back deck. So I took a picture of that, shared it in the group. Neighbors across the street from us had turned their Christmas lights back on this past weekend, really getting into the spirit of things here. And of course, we have more snow on the way this week. The kids even got a day off school, so you know it's a serious business. Listener Amy Steinhauser, who also happens to live in Maple Grove, shared pictures of the snow on her property and then covering her raised beds. So we are blanketed under snow and gardening seems like an unlikely opportunity for us. But May is coming and I'm confident May is going to bring spring to Minnesota. In any case, I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community for the show. This is a free private Facebook group that I host for listeners of the show. These folks are made up of gardeners of all skill levels and locations. Thank goodness, because we get to see pictures of people's gardens from everywhere. We certainly won't have much to show you in Minnesota right now. So it's great to see your gardens in the group. I really enjoy that. And you can find our group very simply by just heading over to Facebook, typing in the name of our group into the search bar, just search for the Still Growing Podcast group, and the listener community will show up at the top of the search results in Facebook. Now, there are a number of benefits that you enjoy by joining the group. First, you get access to all of the garden articles that I curate for you. They'll just appear in your Facebook news feed, and I can't think of anything better to read on Facebook than really quality gardening articles and photos and videos and all that kind of stuff. And then second, the Facebook group is the only place I go when I pick lucky listeners that win giveaways, like many of the wonderful gardening books from the authors that I've interviewed over the years. Third, you get a chance to interact with the great guests that have been on the show, like Mark Highland. He's fantastic. If you ask a question in the group, Mark is certain to answer it. So take advantage of that. And then finally, no spam. The content that I share with the listener community is something that I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. Everything I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's free and easy to join. Just search for the Still Growing Podcast Group and then request to join. All right, let's welcome new members to our group. In fact, our group just passed a 1,000 members, so time to celebrate. But let's welcome Flora Simon, Andrea Nelson, Patricia Hughes, Martine Edwards, Brenda Self-Embry, David Rust, Michelle Baltz. Michelle was recently on talking to us about compost with her fantastic new book on composting for a new generation. Wendy Kyung Spray, the author of The Chinese Kitchen Garden. That was a fantastic episode. Loved that book. Wendy's in the group. If you have any questions about growing vegetables for a kitchen garden, especially vegetables that are used in Chinese cooking, many of which were totally new to me, but I'm very excited to start trying some of these in my 2018 garden. Carol Lucas, Pamela Gerber, Jane Bell Greenman, and Jennifer Ratcliffe. Welcome, you guys. 
you know, the past couple of weeks kind of got away from me. We had spring break, then we went into Easter, and then the snow started to fall in Minnesota. And I have a senior graduating this year. And so we had college visits that were on the docket. And of course, all of our plans got disturbed with the snow. And so we were juggling things around and it impacted my studio time. So unfortunately, I had a little bit of a weather-imposed break in show production, but it was a real treat to go and visit places with my oldest son, Will. And I just wanted to share a few things that I've noticed that have been happening in the listener community. Danny Perkins, I think one of the first people to join the listener community is leaving behind his old garden. He's moving. And he shared just a really cool post showing us some of the first pictures that he had taken of his garden. And of course, anyone in the group knows that we've been able to enjoy Danny's garden over the last couple of years because he shares so many wonderful images and inspiring videos. Anyway, huge transition. Definitely thinking of you today, Danny. But I also bet you are looking forward to the clean palette that awaits you. It's always fun to start a new garden. Very exciting, especially when you know what you're doing. Hats off to David Feinberg, who shared pictures of his crocus popping up through the snow. So you just see this white blanket of snow and then the tips of the crocus, the beautiful purple blooms and just a teeny tiny little bit of the greens popping through. I wrote to David on this Facebook post and I said, in the game of rock, paper, scissors, if you're playing it in the garden, crocus beats snow. So there you have it. Listener Robert Baxter out of New Orleans shared this beautiful image of these amazing amaryllis bulbs that he rescued. His neighbor had passed away. The family was digging them up. And he said, needless to say, I was there with my wheelbarrow to pick them up. And he shared them with many other neighbors. Robert pointed out that it's one of the perks of being retired, that you can keep an eye on what plants folks are throwing away, just monitor what's going on in your neighborhood. Here's a little tip that he shared. He said, whenever I see any of my neighbors digging in their garden, I always go by and pay them a visit. He's gotten many nice things just from visiting with his neighbors who are busy in their garden. Proud of you, Robert. I love that tip. And it's a great way to make garden friends. Listener Wendy Marsman joined the group and she shared, thanks for the ad. I really enjoy the podcast and I'd love to see some photos of your garden, Jennifer. Well, Wendy, now that you bring it up, first of all, welcome to the group. But second of all, my garden is about to undergo a massive makeover this spring. And I think I'm going to do an episode on the transformation. So stay tuned because I'll share that with all of you. But let me just say, here's what's happening. I've got this senior graduating, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm doing what I swore I would never do. And that is go a little crazy because my oldest is leaving the nest. And I think I'm nesting all over again, just like I did before he was born. So the wallpaper in the mudroom and in the powder room on the main level is down and that's all getting redone. Incidentally, I found this super cool botanical print for the powder room and it was out of the Magnolia Home Book. So if you're into wallpaper and you like the show Fixer Upper, Joanna Gaines now has this wallpaper that she's selling. And I thought the book was fantastic. She actually has two books. Anyway, I picked this wallpaper for our powder room. I really like it. It's got a black background and then a very pretty floral print. And I'm going to tell you what it is just in case you're interested. Let me look here. Okay. It's called Heirloom Rose. And the pattern that I got is on page 45. So black background, lots of cream, grays, and beiges in this rose pattern. I really like it, and I'm very excited to have that. Then for my mudroom, I found something in this brand new book that's out by Chesapeake, and it's called Provisions for the Home. It's the Farmhouse book by Chesapeake. And the pattern is called Adamstown, and it's super cool. Actually shows picture frames that have pressed flowers in them. So I thought, you know what? The kids are going to be gone. I'm going to be here with this mudroom by myself. I'm going with a print 
that I'm going to enjoy. As soon as I get these, you guys, I'll share them in the group. It's always great to share wonderful wallpaper finds. So I'm happy to share that with you guys. In any case, let me come full circle on this and tell you that because of my boy graduating, I am doing all kinds of things that I never thought I would do, like re-wallpapering, like painting, like covering the garage floor. And in addition, I am redoing my front and eastern garden. I have reached out to someone in the local garden community I admire so much, and that's Heidi Highland out of the nursery Grow House and her fantastic designer, Connie Ransom, and plans are underway for my redesign. I'll give you a tip. Here's something that makes me feel completely at ease with this project, with this garden reno that I'm about to undertake. And that is probably, I think about five or six years ago, I toured Heidi's personal garden and I felt completely at home. That's why I know I'm going to love the end result. And I've seen some of the initial plans and talked to Connie about some of the plant selections. I'll share all of that with you. Suffice it to say, there's tons going on This garden project is something I'm super excited about. All right, if you want to share what's going on in your garden, make sure to join the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. There's also a phone number for the show. You can call 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769 with any questions, comments, or suggestions that you might have. In addition, you can email me at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A dot com. All right, before I start today's Garden News Roundup, I want to make sure that I talk to you a little bit about today's sponsor, Cobra Head, and my favorite product of theirs, which is the Cobra Head Mini Weeder and Cultivator. Cobra Head has been around for years, and their products are lovingly referred to as the steel fingernail by their many loyal customers. Recently, the Direct Gardening Association recognized Cobra Head as the 2018 Green Thumb Award winner because their products are just that good. Now, the Cobra Head Mini Weeder and Cultivator is a variation on their original product, but this one is smaller. It's just a little over eight inches long. However, it still has that signature Cobra Head blade, that very sharp, strong, heart-shaped tip that is so useful in the garden. Now, I received the Cobra Head Mini Weeder and Cultivator last year as a gift when I attended the Garden Bloggers Fling in Washington, D.C. And when I brought it home, it quickly became one of my all-time favorite tools to use in the garden. It fits perfectly in my garden tote. The handle doesn't hang out, something that always bugs me about garden tools. So I like that it fits nicely in the pockets of my apron and in the compartments of my totes. And I love finding a very useful tool like this, something that I end up actually using in the garden, something that makes gardening easier because let's face it, gardening is hard work. I use it to pry out weeds in tight spaces. I use it when I mix up the soil that I'm going to use in my containers, and I even use it to harvest. It's also great for dividing plants. One of my other favorite features about this tool is that it has a little hole in the handle, which means you can hang it next to your other garden tools on your workbench. I'm an organizer, and I like to keep my garden work areas looking good. So, Thoughtful little features like that make a big difference to me. And I'm happy to share tools like these with you, tools that are simple, practical, and affordable. Now, Cobra Head is giving still growing listeners a 10% off promo code that you can use to purchase anything on their website. And if you buy the Cobra Head Mini Weeder and Cultivator and you use the code still growing, you'll get 10% off. And that makes the Mini Weeder less than $20. So great product and great price. Keep it in mind for yourself 
or for Mother's Day, Father's Day is coming up, birthdays, your favorite gardener, things like that. And hey, I almost forgot to mention, Cobra Head is made in the United States. In fact, right next door to Minnesota in lovely Wisconsin. Cobra Head ships free anywhere in the U.S. Love free shipping. So please support our very first show sponsor, Cobra Head. Just head on over to their website at cobrahead.com and look for the Cobra Head Mini Weeder and Cultivator. It'll get the job done. And don't forget to use the promo code Still Growing, one word or two, either works. And thank you, Cobra Head, for supporting the show. Okie dokie, it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments, from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with. And that's something I call the Dream Guest Segment. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay pretty informed about the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it in the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. First up in the guest update segment is a post that Megan Kane shared with our group. And she shared this post on April 8th. She said, don't make this mistake when you buy vegetable plants. She was at a garden expo one winter chatting with some fellow gardeners. And they started to talk about their terrible luck with peppers from the previous year. And Megan immediately asked them what variety they grew. And the gardeners just kind of looked at each other and said, well, we don't know. We just bought starts from our local big box store. This is where Megan's expertise comes into play. She writes, we all have times when we cut corners in the garden, but buying vegetable starts is not the place to do so. All varieties of one vegetable are not the same. And when Megan started working on vegetable farms, she realized how much time and effort the growers put into selecting varieties that perform well in their fields. In this article, Megan goes on to talk about where you should buy your vegetable plants, and she suggests from a local vegetable farmer. Another great tip is to talk to the sellers at your local farmer's markets. Ask them what varieties they grow. Get growing tips. Even ask for their personal favorites. Finally, Megan shares a free list of her top 10 varieties for the vegetable garden. So make sure to head on over to creativevegetablegardener.com and get Megan's list. In sustainability, CNN shared an article about how Paris is about to turn a third of its green space into urban farms. Back in 2014, Paris got a new mayor named Anne Hidalgo. And when she was elected, she declared that it was her intention to make Paris a greener city. The government of Paris responded to her call. And in 2016, they started Paris Cultures, a project which aims to cover the city's rooftops and walls with vegetation. And one-third of this space is going to be dedicated to urban farming. So Paris is not only intending to produce fruits and vegetables, but they also have a goal of inventing a new urban model, ways to get their citizens involved and become gardeners. That's super cool. In continuing, Ed, listener Danny Perkins shared this great video on buzz pollination, something that can be mimicked with a simple tuning fork. Without buzz pollination, we wouldn't have tomatoes, blueberries, or potatoes. The bumblebees are super important to buzz pollination. They know just what to do. They grab onto the anthers of the flower and they use their buzzing muscles to vibrate their entire body. 
And if you ever watch a bumblebee doing this, you'll hear a loud, higher-pitched buzz than when they're flying. But all that vibration shakes that pollen that's trapped inside the anthers until it's released all over the bumblebee, kind of rains down the pollen, and it's called buzz pollination. Now, in this video, they show how a tuning fork can accomplish the same thing. They tap the tuning fork and make it start to vibrate, and they put it next to the flower, and you can just watch the pollen as it's released out of the anther. It's super cool. And as the video points out, much of the food that we eat owes its existence to that buzz, to that buzz pollination. That one was really interesting, and it's a great one to show the kids as well. Also in continuing ed, I want to remind you to support your local state horticultural societies. Many of them are hosting galas and events this spring, and those are vital for their fundraising efforts for all of their programming for the rest of the year. So make sure you do that. Here in Minnesota, the Spring Garden Gala is happening on Friday, April 27th at 5.30 p.m., And I'm planning to attend. So if you're local and you'd like to attend, just head on over to their website, search for Minnesota State Horticultural Society. You can buy tickets online and you can even request to be at my table. So again, it's the Minnesota State Horticultural Society Spring Garden Gala at the Marriott Northwest in Minneapolis, Friday, April 27th at 5.30. Hope to see you there. In the how-to DIY segment, Gardener's World wrote a very clever post sharing nine different ideas for creating bee hotels, along with inspiring ways to use them in the garden. These insect hotels have become very popular in the last five years. The creative ways that people have come up with to create them truly run the gambit. But this is a very nice little post. If this is one of your projects for your 2018 garden, check this one out. Also in the how-to DIY segment, the Hello Nature blog shared an easy garden hack for DIY seed bombs. These are a fun little Mayday gift. These do-it-yourself seed bombs have just three simple ingredients, air dry clay, potting soil, and flower seeds. This is another fun one to do with the kids. They're cute little gifts. You can shape your seed bomb into like a heart or anything. It doesn't just have to be a little ball. And like I said, they're fun little Mayday gifts as well. In the plant spotlight this week, there was a great article that was featured in The Guardian. It was all about goat willow. I would say willow in general. And one of the things that's attractive about growing willow is that the bees love willows. The title of this article was Goat Willow, Start Your Own Bee Orchestra. Clever title. And then finally, herbalremediesadvice.org featured a post on parsley. Parsley is loaded in minerals. It's known for being an iron supplement. It's high in folic acid. And in the herb community, they know that parsley helps relieve stress by strengthening the nervous system and the functioning of the kidneys. This post was really nice too because they also shared a parsley pesto that looked really good. All right, there were a lot of articles that made it into the news segment here. The first is something that Patricia Chandler Newport out of Detroit shared with us from the Detroit News. It's an article about how the Detroit Mobile Farm is extending their growing season year-round. This effort, by the way, is a collaboration between a local social services agency and a group of ambitious Ford Motor Company employees. Their solution is to grow their farm in a 40-foot enclosed shipping container that's equipped with LED lights and solar panels. Now they can produce crops year-round. And as they say in the article, take that, Mother Nature. (laughs) One of the most inspiring news stories was out of nationalgeographic.com. Simple greenhouses are making a huge difference to the farmers in India. Greenhouses have been used in India for commercial flower and vegetable production, 
but they're often too big and expensive for everyday farmers. So this company called KT has created several scaled down versions. They're smaller and they're more affordable. The farmers that have used these greenhouses are reporting that they're able to produce between five and eight times more with the greenhouse. So that's just fantastic. USA Today is hosting their contest for the best botanical garden. Here's the top 10 from the leaderboard, Longwood Gardens, the Missouri Botanical Garden, Fayarda Botanical Gardens out of Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, Brook Green Gardens, the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, yay, the Desert Botanical Garden out of Phoenix, the Denver Botanic Gardens, the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden out of Coral Gables, Florida, the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, and the Reserve in Bainbridge Island, Washington. Also in the news, the BBC reported on the flowers that Harry and Meghan have chosen for their royal wedding, branches of beech, birch, and hornbeam, as well as white garden roses, peonies, and foxgloves for all of their bouquets. In the Dream Guest segment, PostCity.com shared three spring gardening trends from Toronto Botanical Gardens' Paul Zamet. I loved his trends, but I also really appreciated his tip that he uses to entice his friends to begin gardening. Here's what he said. I make edible bouquets that I share with people if I'm coming to visit them. I'll cut you some rosemary and some thyme and some of my purple African blue basil and bring that over as a gift item with a bottle of wine. Isn't that fantastic? That's why Paul Zamet is my dream guest this week. So Paul, you have a standing invitation to come on over. Bring me a bottle of wine and one of those edible bouquets. That sounds great. All right, in Science This Week, there was an article from CNN. This one was very disturbing. It was a study that linked B decline to cell phones. This is based on research that's been done in India at a university in northern India. What the researchers did is they fitted cell phones to a beehive, and then they powered those cell phones up for two 15-minute intervals every single day. After three months, they found that the bees stopped producing honey. Egg production by the queen was cut in half and the size of the hive overall was reduced. In this article, they quoted Andrew Goldsworthy, a biologist from the Imperial College in London. Andrew had studied the biological effects of electromagnetic fields, and he agrees that it's possible that bees could be affected by cell phone radiation. At the very end, they offer a quote by Norman Carrick, the scientific director of the International Bee Research Association at the University of Sussex. He says that it's still not clear how much radio waves affect bees. He said, we know they are sensitive to magnetic fields. What we don't know is what use they actually make of them. Also in science and related to bees is this giant bee worth $9,000. Back in 1859, entomologist Alfred Russell Wallace was exploring the Indonesian island of Bacan, and he discovered a very strange-looking insect. The specimen was sent to entomologist Frederick Smith of the British Museum. And he determined that the insect was, in fact, a massive bee. In 1860, he wrote this. He said, This species is the giant of the genus to which it belongs and is the grandest addition which Wallace has made to our knowledge of that family. Smith named the bee Mega Chili Pluto, and it's commonly known as Wallace's giant bee. It has a wingspan of nearly two and a half inches. And the article states that it took another 122 years before American Adam Messer would accidentally rediscover this bee in the wild. This article is very fascinating. 
And at one point, it talks about how an insect seller on eBay recently sold a Wallace giant bee specimen for just over $9,000 US. Crazy. Anyway, check that out. It's over in the Still Growing podcast group. If you're interested in looking at that picture of the Wallace giant bee, just search for Wallace in the group and this post will pop up. In shopping this week, I love the blog Miss Mustard Seed, and she had shared a post recently called Five Reasons You Need Hemp Oil in Your Life, and it reminded me how much I like using hemp oil on so many of my garden tools, especially some of the antique tools that I have. Now, you can get Miss Mustard Seed hemp oil, or you can get just any old hemp oil on Amazon. Do yourself a favor and get some hemp oil to freshen up the hemp Handles on many of your garden tools. Over at Terrain, one of my favorite online stores, is this beautiful earth-fired clay pot crate. It's 48 bucks, and what you get is this crate that's full of these little clay pots. They're earth-fired. They have a gray tone, a very worn, earthy tone to them. I fell in love with them. They're fantastic. And in general, if you're looking for furniture, outdoor decoration, or utility items, Terrain is fantastic. And you can find it at shopterrain.com. In recipes, I have stumbled on a fantastic cookbook. It's the Pesto Cookbook by Olwen Woodier. This is a story publication, and I can't think of anything better to have fun experimenting with in the kitchen than this pesto cookbook. This book as well mentions a parsley pesto, back to parsley being featured in our plant spotlight. There is a mint pesto that incorporates feta cheese. There's a pesto that even incorporates chocolate. There's 116 recipes in this pesto cookbook. Again, it's called The Pesto Cookbook by Olwyn Woodier. So check that out. I'll have a link to that in the Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. In inspiration, arts and culture shared just a spectacular post on women botanical artists. It's a gorgeous post. Super inspiring. Then finally, our quotables this week all have to do with soil in honor of today's show. Here's an old Amish saying, feed the soil, not the plant. Here's one written by C.B. Palmer from Memoir Written with a Non-Green Thumb, the New York Times Magazine, June 12th, 1949. The earth is nice and moist, crumbles beautifully in the fingers. But that nice crumbly effect extends precisely one and one-fourth inches below the surface. Between seasons, somebody, probably a foreign power, has put in a concrete gun emplacement just under the topsoil. Here's one from Marion Cran. If I were beginning again, Gardens of Character, 1940. It was not mine, I found, to coerce and to dictate. If I wanted to have a happy garden, I must align myself with my soil, study and help it to the utmost, untiringly. Always the soil must come first. Here's one from William Bryant Logan, Dirt, the Ecstatic Skin of the Earth, 1995. The pH value is one of the few instances in daily life where moderation is graphically praised. Tell a gardener that his soil's pH is 14 or zero, he will keel over in a faint. Even three or eight is very unpleasant to hear. No, a gardener cannot be pleased unless the number is greater than five and less than 7.5. The middle terms are where fertility lies. (laughs) 
Finally, here's one from Carol Capick, The Gardener's Year, 1931. A good soil, like good food, must not either be too fat or heavy or cold or wet or dry or greasy or hard or gritty or raw. It ought to be like bread, like gingerbread, like a cake, like leavened dough. It should crumble, but not break into lumps. Under the spade, it ought to crack, but not to squelch. It must not make slabs or blocks or honeycombs or dumplings. But when you turn it over with a full spade, it ought to breathe with pleasure and fall into a fine and puffy tilth. That is a tasty and edible soil, cultured and noble, deep and moist, permeable, breathing and soft. In short, a good soil is like good people. And as is well known, there is nothing better in this veil of tears. Well, that's the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, Practical Organic Gardening Explained, plus how to solve garden challenges naturally with Mark Highland. I said at the top of the show, there's that old saying that's used to describe starting with the basics or fundamentals from the ground up. And when it comes to organic gardening, you literally start with the ground or the soil. Why is that? My kids would say, duh, to grow healthy plants. True, we want healthy, happy plants. But the real focus when it comes to building healthy soil is creating a paradise for the superstars of gardening, the hardest working, most vitally important aspect of soil life, microbes. All the minerals and nutrients we obsess about, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, iron, magnesium, matter less than microbes because microbial activity is vital to fertility. And the number one thing we can do to create a microbial paradise in our gardens is to stop using the synthetic fertilizers and pesticides used in conventional gardening and begin adding organic matter to the soil with compost, cover crops, legumes, and so on. Here are just a few of the benefits that the USDA attributes to organic gardening. Increased soil fertility, decreased fertilizer and herbicide use, decreased energy use, you lock great amounts of carbon in the soil, and increased profitability for growers. Here are a few important points to keep in mind for today's episode. Chemical fertilizers quickly push lush, soft growth that's full of salt, something that deer browsers insects, and pests are drawn to. Think about it as if you were laying out chips and salsa at a party. We're all drawn to that. It tastes good. There's lots of salt. The same thing happens when you push that growth with chemical fertilizer. Second, organic gardens cultivate a greater understanding of your garden. When challenges arise, instead of reaching for a quick fix with a chemical spray, you end up doing research to fully understand the origin of this issue, this challenge that you're facing. And ultimately, most organic gardeners find that they end up connecting with other organic gardeners to fully understand the problem and the range of solutions available. Third, 
Ornamental plants do not need a ton of fertilizer. Fourth, salt-based chemical fertilizers negatively impact sensitive microbes. If you take nothing else away from this episode, remember that. Fifth, the wonderful thing about soil is that it can be healed. Organic matter feeds soil microbes, and soil can recover from years of use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Six, think of plants as mulch. When you have a dense enough planting, you don't even need mulch. The plants act as mulch. And as someone who loves plants and tends to plant pretty heavily, This was a practice I quickly gravitated to when I first started gardening. And to this day, ground covers are something I'm a huge fan of. And I'm always surprised by how much my affection for them grows year after year. Finally, know what fertile soil looks like. Fertile soil has dark color, loose structure, and an earthy smell. I always tell my student gardeners, use your senses when you're examining soil. Don't taste it, but definitely feel it. Look at it. Touch it. Break it up in your fingers. The structure should be loose and crumbly. The color should be dark and rich, and it should smell good. So there you have it. We're talking about gardening naturally today how to ditch the chemicals and pesticides with the organic mechanic. Here's practical organic gardening explained, plus how to solve garden challenges naturally with Mark Highland. Well, welcome back to the Still Growing Podcast, Mark. Thanks for having me. You know, it's always nice to be able to follow your passion by writing about it, by being able to share it with the world in a little broader platform. Yeah, that's why I wrote this book. You know, I was excited to be able to reach a lot more people than I currently do with our company and social media and whatnot. So I I jumped at the chance to write it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people right now are deciding whether or not they even want to get going in a garden this summer. And now's the time that they're making those choices. And sometimes life's too busy to want to get going gardening. And other times the the way is cleared and, and people are excited to garden. They have a new house or they have a property or an area that they suddenly can tend on their own. And organic gardening is the next natural question, I think, for people is, okay, I'm in a garden. Now, what's all this about organic gardening and how do I get started? When we were talking in the pre-chat, you said your favorite chapter is the very first chapter that talks all about the benefits of organic gardening. So it's really the why. Why should we consider organic gardening? And for those folks who are attempting to start gardening, perhaps for the first time, what would you tell them? What would be the case you would make for going organic? Sure. Well, you know, I I do kind of lay it all out there that um, when you talk about, you know, practical organic gardening, you know, many of those tenants are just practical gardening tenants. And it just so happens that they're organic, right? But the reason why everyone should really consider being organic in the garden is that, you know, yes, a lot of people instantly think of a vegetable garden, you know, an organic garden, organic food, uh, which really is important and is a great intro or segue into organic gardening, uh, being a vegetable gardener. Because those are things you're eating, of course. Um, so anything that you are consuming, I would encourage to you know grow organically. But it's about more than just the food. When I say it's about more than just the food, I mean it's also about your environment, right? When we are gardening organically, yes, you're reaping all the benefits on your own property. Um, but you have to think about well, we are part of a much bigger ecosystem, and your backyard is home to a diversity of not only plants, but animals, the insects that live there, the birds that come in. Uh, it's, a, it's a whole system, right? And so when we're gardening organically, we are making the air cleaner. We're working towards cleaner water, healthier soil, 
but we're also supporting a bigger ecosystem than just our gardens. You know, if you think about it like an organic garden, you have some insect problems, and that's okay because there's other things that will come in to deal with those insect problems. That's the cycle of life. That's part of nature. Uh, you know, if you have caterpillars uh, laid by you know, moths or butterflies on your plants, uh, that's food for birds. You know, birds need to feed their babies about 200 caterpillars a day in the growing season. And if you're gardening organically, you have that food in your property, in your garden. And if you don't, then you don't. And you're not going to contribute to the greater good of the ecosystem services that an organic garden can provide. And even if you don't have a big property, even if you just have a porch, and on apartment, you know, that you can still have that life um, from gardening in whatever space you have. And even if you're just indoor gardener, you know, house plants, you know, keeping them organic is very important because they are directly purifying the air that you breathe. And of course, you wouldn't want to spray them. So it's about more than just food. You know, it's really about a, a paradigm shift of looking at things in a different way and remembering that, you know, we're part of a much bigger system and it's not just your backyard. I like that. And, you know, when we're speaking about organic gardening, it, the most simple answer for folks who are saying, well, what is organic gardening? It's basically that you're committed to not using pesticides or synthetic fertilizers, that you're going to run into the same problems everybody else does when they're gardening. You're just going to choose not to go down that path. You're going to do something else, another method to treat these same issues, but you're going to handle it organically. I think it's important to reassure people that when they make this choice to go organic, and I think once you make that big choice, then it's just a series of choices after that for how do I handle this and what are the options? Let's give them some assurance. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, you know, even in the organic garden, you know, there's a solution for everything, just like there is, in a, you know, in a conventional garden. But right there, it's just looking at it through a different lens, right? So there's, I mean, there's there's a million different uh, solutions, and it's really about the specific problem, right? So it's identifying the pest or the disease that you're dealing with through doing your own research online, in books, going to your local garden center. Um, and by your local garden center, I mean like your mom and pop type garden center, not necessarily a, a box uh, where they don't necessarily have the long term experience there. Um, you know, ge generally speaking, your mom and pop type garden center is going to have a lot more accumulated knowledge on staff to help you solve problems. And usually they have at least one person on staff that knows the organic side of things. Um, but there, there is there's an answer for everything in organics. And sometimes that answer is yeah, there's some holes in the leaves out there and I don't really care because otherwise I have to spend my time and money buying something to spray on that plant that may or may not insect because the insect could be gone. You, know, you have to go out and look, right? So it does require a little bit more thought, careful um, thought put into the garden because um, you don't just want to see a problem, go out and buy something, spray it and think you're done because that you may not have even treated the pest appropriately. Organic gardens are in the long run, in my opinion, less intense over up in the garden and the ornamental outside, you know, the perennials, the woodies, the grasses, that kind of thing, you know, that encourages ground beetles. And when you have a lot of ground beetles, they will eat a lot of the pest insects. And if you get some aphids on a rose or, a, or whatever, um, you know, if you leave it alone long enough, I guarantee you some predators will show up to eat those plant, those aphids. Um, but if it's on your pepper plants and they're little and you know, then you need to take action so that you can still harvest those peppers later on down the line. But there's organic solutions that are a lot more simple than you'd think sometimes. Like, hey, guess what? Just spray those aphids off with some water. And you know what? If you're not squeamish, use your two fingers, your two digits, one of your best tools in an organic garden, and just get in there and squish a whole bunch of them, and then hit it with water to rinse it off a little bit. You've disrupted a like cycle. They're not going to come back as fast. And maybe you gave the plant enough time to hold off until that beneficial insect can come around, whether it's ladybug larva or lacewing larva, or, you know, any one of the number of multiples of things that nature can throw at that pest. You know, nature is extremely resilient. And if you just give it some time, a lot of things will just take care of themselves naturally. Um, but certainly there are times where you need to step in and, and do some cultural controls on some things so that a problem doesn't get out of hand. 
there, there is an answer for everything in the organic gardening realm, but it might require a little bit of extra thought and work to get it. But that's the joy of organic gardening. Once you've done it and you learned it, now you know it for life. And, um, you know, it's that we're constantly learning and you're constantly building. You know, the next best thing you can do as an organic gardener is talk to your organic gardener friends. Uh, you know, gardeners are a good bunch of folks. Gardeners love talking about gardens, solving problems with each other. I mean, that's one of the joys of being a gardener is connecting with other people and, and you know, talking about these things. Then on top of that, you know, there's a million conferences and, and workshops and all kinds of places you can go and learn more um, because the more you learn about organic gardening, you just have a bigger uh, repertoire to pull from when it comes to dealing with pests or diseases or any other aspect of, of the garden. I loved the point you just made about connecting with other organic gardeners, especially if you're new to organic gardening, because that's really how we learn everything, I think, gardening-related that sticks with us. It's it's asking a friend or asking someone in the community, in the gardening community that's doing it. There's just nothing more reassuring. And, you know, that's the way gardening has been done for centuries, right? We usually had a grandma or, or parent that was teaching us how to do that. Nowadays, we don't always have that. And so seeking out garden clubs or groups of people in your community that that share your interests, that's the next best thing. That's a fantastic point. What do you say to people who use chemicals? They're using pesticides, they're using fertilizers, and they've just never really given it much thought other than, well, I have this problem, I was using this to fix it. And now they're beginning to question, okay, do I really wanna do this? And if they're tempted to start organic gardening, how do you suggest that they transition away from using pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and go the organic route? How do they make that change? Sure. I think it starts one decision at a time. I think that, um, you know, start with the low-hanging fruit, you know, the easiest things to do. Um you know, first of all, if you do have, um, you know, pesticides you've been using and that kind of thing, I mean, number one, um, if you're going to stop using them, then I would, you know, you definitely want to uh, dispose of those things properly with your county when they're having like a hazardous material drive. But otherwise, I'd say, you know, look, you use them up so that they're not going in a landfill somewhere mm-hmm. um, and, th- and then make, you know, OK, I-, I used up that product. I don't have any more of it. I have to deal with the same pest some way. The organic materials have come a long way in the past 10 years. There's a lot more that you can use to control pests and diseases than there used to be. A lot of them are biocontrols, as they're like to be called. So, you know, for example, there's, there's things that you can spray on insects that'll kill them. It's like a, a bacteria that will impact the, the insect, right? And so that's a lot better than a pesticide. And technically, it's still a pesticide because anything you spray on a plant to kill something, that is a pesticide, but they're organic pesticides or they're, they're biocontrols, mm-hmm. um, kind of fighting nature with nature. So, you know, maybe do a little research or talk to some friends uh, you know, to figure out, okay, what's, what's a good alternative here instead of just spraying it? Honestly, your, your health is the most important thing you have as a human being, you know, your health, your family, your, you know, and when you use a whole lot of pesticides and you don't follow the PPE or the personal protective equipment, right? Like, you know, basic stuff, latex gloves or, you know, spraying when it's not windy and, you know, making sure you're wearing pants and long sleeves so you don't get that stuff on yourself. You know, you're, you're keeping yourself healthy by switching away, right? So, um, and it's not just you, if you have other family members, you know, if you have the fur babies, you got, you got dogs and cats at home, they're going to be running through those pesticides as well. So, you, you know, you really have to you know, thinking, you know, twice about spraying some of that stuff. But as far as, you know, what you would use to transition, I mean, it's really one decision at a time, knowing that, look, nothing happens overnight. Look, it takes three years for a conventional farm to certify into organic, to be a certified organic farm, the three-year waiting period. And that's so that any remaining chemicals that were used on the property will biodegrade over that time frame. Mm. It's, you know, it's a spectrum. It's a, it's a journey. So if you're becoming an organic gardener, you know, don't feel bad that you still are doing some pesticides. I mean, there's nothing to feel bad about, you know, Hey, your garden is your place to to enjoy, to have fun, to connect with nature, 
all of those things. So you should never feel bad about taking longer to transition or, or, or any of that. I'd say just go for it. Start doing it. Every organic decision you make on your property will build an impact over time, and it's going to help support a greater ecosystem than just your own backyard. You know, you're, you're, you're giving back to the environment, to the earth at that point. You know, it's going to take time and that's okay. Well, I think what you just said is a good segue into this next question. And it has to do with being an ornamental gardener versus a gardener that's growing edibles. And that's a pathway into edibles for so many people. They start out growing flowers and ornamentals and, and pretty things because that's what they're drawn to. And then over time, they think, oh, maybe I'll grow some herbs or I love basil. And before you know it, they're adding more and more edibles into the landscape. And I think for a lot of people, that can also be the pain point or the point at which they decide that they want to look into being an organic gardener. Then that triggers the question, well, what do I do? Because I've been using synthetic fertilizers and pesticides in my ornamental beds, and now I want to start growing food there. What would you say to someone who has been using them and then now wants to use that same area to begin to grow edibles and they're concerned about that? Sure. So that's going to come down to a little bit of knowing what you've been using, what you've been putting down. Because there are some things that have a longer half-life than others, and that comes in the pesticide category, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because there are some things that might be available a lot longer. So that's kind of like knowing what you have. So if you read the label of a product that you have and it says, oh, this kills insects for, you know, six months. Like I I do it once and I don't have to spray the plant again for six months. Well, then that plant is definitely going to have that stuff on there for six months. So in your transition, if you've already done it, well, there's nothing else you can do at that point except, you know, wait it out when it comes to sprays and that kind of thing. But when it comes to fertilizer, you know, same thing, you know, use up what you have. If you have, uh, you know, chemical-based fertilizer, then I would encourage you to switch to a more organic-based approach There's lots of organic fertilizers on the market now. If you grow roses and you want an organic rose food, there's a a fertilizer for that now. Um, A lot of the organic fertilizers are pretty general, though, because plants across the board are going to use pretty similar fertilizer. And a lot of plants in the landscape honestly don't even need that much fertilizer. If you have good practices and you have decent soil to start with, if you're starting with you know, urban soil or just poor soils, well, yeah, you're going to be doing a bit more soil amendment work than the rest of us in terms of adding compost and some nutrients. But what will happen is that if you've been using salt-based chemical fertilizer for a long time, you have by default kind of selected for a particular subset of biology to be present. Because when you look at the soil biology, some of the microbes are very easygoing, right? They can get their food from different sources and it's not a big deal. And if there's too much salt present, well, it doesn't bother them. But there's other microbes that just can't handle certain conditions, and therefore they will really start to disappear from the soil profile. But the wonderful thing about soil and nature is that if you make the switch, eventually the nutrient levels will kind of stabilize because the plants will be taking them up, and then you can switch to an organic based. And when it comes to fertilizer, The most important thing to do is to get a soil test. You have to know what you're starting with because, hey, there may be tons of nutrients available and you don't need to fertilize at all. Mm. With ornamental plants, they don't need a whole lot of fertilizer. If you're giving your ornamental plants a lot of fertilizer and you notice that you have a lot of insect problems each year or deer browsing or whatever, um, you know, part of that comes from fertilizer pushing lush, soft growth that is full of nutrients, aka salts. You know, there's, there's definitely been research done that shows that um, animals, insects, prefer plants that have been fertilized because they taste a little better to them, right? <laughs> it's like we're laying out chips and salsa there. Exactly, right, <laughs> right. So you don't need a ton. Now, in the vegetable garden, you know, anything that's an annual, right, they need a lot of fertilizer, right? And there's another thing that most people don't realize that when you buy a plant, You know, all of these nurseries that are growing plants, they're growing them by fertilizing them at every watering, just about. That's how they get them to grow up and be so beautiful and look so great at the garden center. And you go buy it and you're like, ooh, this thing's awesome. You take it home, plant it. Um, Again, perennials, grasses, woody plants, that kind of thing. I always say to, I think it's good to fertilize at 
at planting yeah. because you're helping that plant get off to a good, healthy start so that it can root faster, so it can get established quicker, so it can live through that first winter, all of those things. I think it's good to fertilize a little bit at first planting. But after that, you don't need a ton because the plant should start looking for its own resources in the soil. The soil has a huge bank of nutrients, and it's just about the plant getting established so it can access those nutrients and maybe make a mycorrhizal relationship in the soil to help it get more nutrients. But, but these plants are fertilized from day one, and they're fertilized almost at every watering. And the plants that need fertilizer are the hungry ones. They're annuals. So we're talking yeah. anything in the vegetable garden, any of the annual plants that we, a lot of people plant you know, after your first frost date is gone. So those plants benefit from fertilizer because, let's face it, it's an annual. You want it to get big, beautiful, gorgeous. You want it to have 100 blooms on it, 1,000 blooms on it, whatever it is. You want like you know a couple dozen peppers. You don't just want three or four peppers or, or mm-hmm. whatever. So fertilizer is a necessary thing when it comes to that. A lot of people don't realize how important fertilizer is in the vegetable garden, especially if they're used to, well, I plant, you know, this and that in my vegetable garden. I'm getting stuff out of it. It's true. You will, but you'll get more if you fertilize. You know, same thing. If you are growing annuals, you'll get more flowers, more blooms. They'll look bigger, healthier. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about containers or in the ground. You still have to fertilize. But, you know, the ornamental landscape just doesn't require as much as long as you have, you know, decent soil to the plant should start to get what it needs from the soil to be more hardy and established where you planted it. These are great points. If people are regularly adding organic matter to their soil, do they need to do anything else? Is there anything else they should be considering? So adding organic matter is good because you're you're feeding soil microbes, you know, in a forest all the leaves fall and decompose in the soil in the forest. Right? But most of us rake all the leaves. Maybe you compost them on site, which, of course, I recommend highly. But some places, you know, you don't have space for a compost pile, et cetera. And so you send it all off someplace else to get composted. Hopefully not the landfill because that's a valuable resource. But, you know, in our gardens, they're not. a lot of people don't let leaves fall to the ground to replace. So you have to add you know, organic matter in, in terms of, you know, compost is my favorite mulch or way to add organic matter. You know, more and more, I would encourage people to think of plants as mulch. And when you have a dense enough planting, then you don't even need mulch because the plants are acting as mulch so that they're not letting weed seeds kind of come through and grow. You know, that's how nature likes to grow is, uh, you know, every wild area you can think of. It's usually like plant to plant. and, And, you know, unless you talk about the woodland understory, which is a whole other thing. But, you know, in that case, the trees above you are plant to plant and there's no free space. The soil test is going to tell you a lot. That's going to tell you what your pH is, which is important because that tells you how available the nutrients are. And you can change the pH of your soil if you need to. It's going to tell you if you have a good amount of calcium or if your soil is calcium deficient. And it kind of goes all the way through all the nutrients that that soil test will tell you if you're deficient or not. And if you are deficient in something like calcium, for example, well, there's things you can add to just apply calcium, right? You could apply azomite. You could apply bone meal. You could apply lime. You could, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can apply. You know, the, the nice thing about you know, being organic is that you get to choose what you're putting on your property, right? If you only want to use plant-based fertilizers because that's your thing, hey, go for it. There's a whole bunch of them, right? Um, if you don't mind animal-based fertilizers, there's some really good ones out there. And then, of course, there's minerals, which are things like the azomite. There's things like green stamp, limestone, right? Uh, rock, phosphate. If you think about it, these are things that are like uh, minerals that are in powdered form, things that are mined out of the ground. Those are also great amendments. But I wouldn't just go to the store and buy a bunch of organic fertilizer and then throw it down all over the place thinking that you're doing a good thing because you just need to know what you're doing beforehand because you might just be wasting your money. Maybe you have all those nutrients in abundance, but you can't know that unless you get a soil test. And the places to go for a soil test, every state has a land university, right? And that's like the ag school for the state. And just about all of them have a cooperative extension arm that does soil testing. You know, I live in Pennsylvania. So for us, it's Penn State and they have a, the cooperative extension does testing. It's not that expensive. And there's totally instructions online for how to take the test, 
how to send it in and all that to make sure it's accurate. And then when they send you the results back, there's going to be some interpretation there. And generally speaking, if you have a whole lot of questions and you can't get the answers yourself, then you can call them and ask, be like, um, you said this, and why did you say that? And they can help you interpret the results of your soil test. Um, and then there's lots of private labs that do that as well. You know, some certainly better than others. Some are faster than others. But yeah, you, you can't really know what to put down until you get a test and know what you already have. And then you can start making some decisions from there. Yeah, great point. Now's the time to get out there and get your soil test going if you can. If you're able to get a sample and send it in now before the rush, because everybody does it first thing in the spring. So getting your soil sample taken and sent in quickly is, is always good. First thing in the spring before they get overwhelmed with requests. Let's talk a little bit. This was a listener question and it had to do with containers. There are people who every single year they're growing in their containers and they begin the year by throwing out all of the soil that's currently in their container and starting completely over. And then there are other people who say, oh, I never do anything with it. What's the right answer or what's the best way to look at what you should do with the soil in your container? Sure. So for container gardening, you know, I, I recommend, you know, number one, all organic matter is breaking down at all times, right? That's just a given. Okay. So no matter what is in that container, no matter what soil is in there, it's going to have broken down a little bit over the course of the year when you used it. Right. You know, if you live in a area that's prone to lots of snow and ice and um, you have to be concerned about your terracotta containers, you know, cracking and breaking. So those especially, you you uh, ideally want to dump out all that soil and then store the container someplace dry so they don't break on you. Do I do that? No, I'm, I'm totally guilty of having lots of containers break on me over the years. But you know what? It's just part of gardening and I'm just, I'm cool with that. That's okay for me. You know, it's just like, oh, that container broke after five winters outside. Looks like it's time to bump it up into a new size pot. You know, um, and then I and I have some that make it for whatever reason. Every winter they've been outside ten years and they never break. They're fine. Yeah. Um, so if you have big containers, you plant annuals in each year, and you're getting ready to prepare that container for the current season's annuals. Number one, you want to get rid of any remaining root balls or stems and whatnot that are present. Certainly, uh, put all that stuff in the compost pile. But I say just kind of fluff up the soil. Um, and it is good to fluff up the entire container just because the bottom of the container, that soil is going to be pretty dense. And so by fluffing it up a little bit, you're just helping the roots get down in there. And I also know of a lot of our landscape customers and friends that they'll take off the top inch or two inches of soil and essentially put that either in the ground somewhere or they'll, they'll use it someplace else to recycle it into the, the landscape. Um, but removing that top one to two inch layer in a container, you're getting rid of any weed seeds that fell in there, if that's, a, if that's a concern for you. You're also removing the salt layer that has risen to the top. That tends to happen in containers where the, the salt will kind of uh, accumulate at the surface where it generally stays a bit drier compared to the bottom of the pot where it's more moist. For some people, that's a concern. If you're not over fertilizing, well, then you don't even have to worry about that. But a lot of people do it primarily for the weed seed thing because stuff just blows in. If you have lots of plants and they're going to seed, you know, seeds are tiny, so you don't always see them, you know. Like I have um, black-eyed Susans that I let kind of seed around uh, in the landscape because I like that they're, they're, they're awesome. They're a great pollinator plant. And <laughs> those seed heads have a million seeds. So if the wind is blowing hard one day, like it could just be throwing those seed into my containers. <laughs> And then you get a million little seedlings in springtime if you don't do that technique I was talking about. Yeah. And sometimes there's nothing you can do and, and you make, you know, lemonade and you just pick them out and plant them somewhere else, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, definitely fluff it up. Use it again. Add more soil if you have to. Fresh soil to get it back to that top area. Because, again, all plants grow directly proportional to the volume of soil that they are growing in. So the more soil you have, the bigger that plant can get. So you want to kind of top off the containers. And then if you are growing vegetables or annuals, absolutely, you want to mix in fresh fertilizer. The fertilizer you mixed in last fall or, or at the last planting you did, it's by and large, those plants used it all up and you need to start fresh, put down fresh fertilizer for them, um, you know, especially when you talk about gardening and containers. 
Now, when you talk about fluffing up the soil, lightening up the soil, especially in containers, do you like to add perlite? Is that one of your go-tos or is there something else? Sure. So when I when I say fluffing up the soil, I mean, you know, putting those gloves on and get in there and, you know, literally grab every last handful of that soil and kind of bring it up to the surface, break it up a little bit, and you're, you're mixing it all together at the same time while you're doing that. So that is fluffing up the soil. And then as far as adding something else to it, I would say the best thing to add is the exact same soil that you used previously or one up it and, you know, put in like a a better soil. And by that, I mean, let's say you did a container last fall and it didn't really lose a whole lot of volume because it was just, you know, you did some, some fall plantings. Maybe you put a grass in there and some ornamental kale and some pansies and and, and a winter green or something, yeah, something cool. So that's not going to have lost a whole lot of volume. So you basically, if you don't want the grass there anymore, don't throw it away. That's still a good plant. Go put it in your landscape someplace. Even, you know, if you're redoing stuff for spring, you don't okay. want that grass in there anymore. But then, you know, if you haven't lost a lot of volume, maybe all you need to do is add some worm castings, right? That's a great amendment. There's biology. There's a little bit of nutrients in worm castings, but it, generally, but it's, it's usually about the biology and the organic matter that you're adding. But my number one thing to add would just be the same potting soil you used the first time. But you, you asked about perlite. Yeah. And, um, you know, perlite is a great uh, thing to lighten a soil to make it more well-drained. However, you know, we prefer uh, rice hulls at Organic Mechanics to perlite just because rice hulls do the same thing. They allow for drainage. They're more earth-friendly because they do break down over time and they actually contribute some nutrients to the soil profile. Mm. And they are 100% grown and raised uh, domestically, the ones that we use, but they are just a more earth-friendly alternative to perlite. Perlite's a silica ore. It has to be mined out of the ground. It's got to be heated up to intense heats to pop it like popcorn kind of and then turn it into perlite. So rice hulls are a byproduct of growing and harvesting rice. The hull, H-U-L-L, is the shell around the rice. Right? So these is a byproduct. And so why not use that as opposed to something you got to mine out of the ground and it's very energy intensive. You know, it's a great thing for fluffing up, you know, lightening a soil to increase drainage. But in the in the true sense of the word, when I said fluff up your container soil, I just meant kind of get in there with your hands, yeah. work it, break it up. And uh, certainly gloves are the best thing to have on. You know, any experienced gardener, I mean, your, your pair of gloves is like one of your best investments. Otherwise, you're just constantly going to end up with, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I have dirt <laughs> under my nails right now. I've got dirt and all the cracks <laughs> on my hands right now because... We all know you don't always yeah. have time to go get the gloves. You That's just right. do it because you're standing there. But mm-hmm. in general, when you're doing those big jobs, uh, you know, gloves are worth their weight in gold for sure. Yeah. Get a pair of gloves. Now, um, I have to ask, you mentioned it in your book, and it is something that I hear from time to time as well. It's the difference between potting soil and garden soil. Right. Yeah, because a lot of it's it's amazing when you you talk to folks about this stuff and, and they're like, man, I had no idea. Like it, it says soil. So I thought it was soil. Like what's, <laughs> the, you know, but yes, there is a big differentiator between potting soil and garden soil. You know, potting soil is actually a soil less media made up of ingredients that don't contain any soil. And this is historic based on, you know, when kind of potting soil was kind of invented, you know, in the fifties, you know, cause, cause prior to that people use very manure based, you know, farm type mixes and they may have had some soil in there. If you go all the way back to England, the classic John Innes soil blends, there was topsoil in those blends. But today, it, it, it's changed. And it's now all about soil-less media, which is different than soil. So soil, topsoil, soil, the stuff that's under the ground, under your grass, under your feet, when you're walking around in the forest, I mean, actual soil is very mineral-based. Potting soil for containers is totally different than what's in the ground under your feet, you know, under the lawn, uh, in the beds, in the landscape. So soil itself, it's sand, silt, clay. Those are mineral particles. Is mineral. There's organic matter, certainly, a fraction of organic matter in the soil. And that's where all of your microbes are going to be living, you know, and eating the organic matter. Then you also have water and airspace. And that's it in soil, right? And the soil texture that you have is going to be based on where you live. Because some soils are certainly more sandy than others, and so that's going to be more free-draining versus if you live in the south or the Midwest and you just have a lot of clay, well, you know your soil doesn't drain very well because you have a lot of a lot more clay in your soil 
versus on the east on the seaboard you have more sand in your soil and these soil types were developed over millennia on the continents that we live on and so you can't change your soil type very easily but in a container the choice is up to you right because potting soil for containers you get to choose what ingredients you're going to be gardening and simply by default when you buy a product at the store to either mix your own or buy a pre-made blend of potting soil. Because potting soil has lots of ingredients that could go in there. The typical ones in most brands of potting soil is peat, perlite, vermiculite, and pine bark. At least on the East Coast, those are the most ubiquitous. If you go to the West Coast, you're talking it's fir bark instead of pine bark. Hmm. Because on the East Coast, we use pine trees for wood and pulp and paper. And on the West Coast, they use Douglas fir. So it's a byproduct of that industry and horticulture, growing plants, has, has made good use of that. So when you buy a tree at a nursery on the East Coast, odds are it was grown in a mix that had a lot of pine bark in it because that's the most economical thing that a grower, a nursery grower can grow in. There's so many different things. Peat moss. Um, you know, we are a peat-free company at Organic Mechanics for a few different reasons, but it's kind of that environmental sustainability thing. You know, that's why we use rice hulls instead of perlite. But you know, there's cocoa fiber, there's compost, there's worm castings, there's rice hulls. There are a million different things that you can put into a soil as far as fertilizers go. But, I mean, those are some of the main ingredients when you talk about potting soils. And every potting soil will tell you. You just look at it and see what the ingredients are. It'll be on the package on the back. So you can see what's in it before you buy it. Let's just pretend that... You were looking at a selection of potting soils and there were no ingredients and you just had to use your five senses to look at the potting soil and then make your own judgment about what's the best one. What would you be looking for? What would you be feeling for? Sure. Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's the first thing I'd you, you know, get your hand in there right away. So grab a handful of it and give it the uh, the squeeze test, right? So go ahead, squeeze it in your hand. And then once you open your hand back up, how easy does it fall back apart? If you kind of touch it with your thumb and it immediately starts like falling apart, breaking up, that's good because that means it's going to have a pretty good porosity, right? Like, and, which means it's going to drain well. And again, these are all rough estimates, but it's a pretty good guide. You know, I'm going to look for a nice dark color. You know, the, the darker the color, the more ingredients like compost and worm castings are, will be in there. So... I, I like the darker color because it also means a more aged product, right? So that's good too. You know, if you don't like perlite, well, that, uh, that kind of the white stuff that blows around in your garden, like you can choose a mix that doesn't have it. But all in all, I'm looking for something with a nice dark color, something that smells earthy, has a nice, good earthy smell to it. Also, like I said, one that will break back up when you squeeze it. And I mean, like, give it everything you got when you squeeze it because you want to see if you compact it, does it break right back up again? And if it does, that means it's got pretty good structure. Um, if it stays kind of like a, um, cause if you did it with garden soil, right. And you squeeze a, a handful of it, it, you know, if there's any clay content in there, it's going to stay together. Like you just made a pinch pot when you're back in the garden, you know, <laughs> yep. like, so that's a way to tell kind of what's going on in the soil, just with your, um, your hands, your eyes and your, your sense of smell. Like that's important too. If it smells bad, don't put a plant in it, you know, leave it <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> hey, at, at a garden center, you have to think sometimes those bags have been sitting there for six months. Yeah. Maybe they've gotten rain a hundred times and maybe they're a little compacted. So if you open a bag and it doesn't smell great, you know, if, if you can, you know, just dump it out in a wheelbarrow or a five gallon bucket or just leave the bag open for a while. Mix it up a little bit so that oxygen can get back in there. Um, let, again, this is like letting nature take its course. It'll re-aerate oxygenate and if there is any if it smells bad you're probably smelling ammonia or maybe some sulfur mm. that kind of thing which might happen when it, if it goes anaerobic but you can bring it back just by making it aerobic again mixing it up and if it smells bad hey just give it a minute don't use it right away but uh, most likely you can bring it back mm, great point yeah, one of my favorite chapters in your book is chapter four, where you're talking about all of the fertilizers and the amendments that you can add. I always geek out on that because it's very interesting. I always feel like I need to learn more and more about that. But you mention a rock star when it comes to an amendment that you can add for soil productivity. And of course, it's biochar. A lot of people have heard of biochar. I don't know that everybody fully understands the history of biochar and what it's all about. 
Tell us everything, Mark. <laughs> yeah. So biochar is a very interesting soil amendment technology. It's based on the terra preta soils of the Amazon. So these are very historically very thin soil layers that were made more productive by the addition of, of carbon. And to do this, they essentially you burn biomass, you know, wood, etc., and then you're adding the carbon to the soil. And so this is a lot of people ask, like, well, can I just add stuff to my wood stove? Is that biochar? Well, technically, if there's still actual coals left, then technically that's that's getting there. But it's not ash, right? Biochar is not ash. It's carbon. So biochar itself, when made well, does so many great things for soil. It'll boost your yield because what it does is it holds on to nutrients quite well. Biochar has what's called cation exchange capacity. It also has anion exchange capacity. This means it holds nutrients well. It can hold the positively charged ones and some of the negatively charged ones. You know, research done by the USDA and other places has shown that it's hanging out of the nutrients. So nutrients aren't washing through your soil profile. So when they're held in the soil, they're there and available for plant roots to uptake. So it boosts yield and plant growth by holding nutrients in the soil. It becomes a home for biology in the soil. If you look at biochar blown up on an electron microscope, you essentially see all these little tunnels, right? Because you burned everything flammable off that piece of carbon. And what you're left with is the pure skeletal structure. And that skeletal structure is incredibly resistant to decomposition, which is pretty really slow. In terms of a human lifetime, it's a permanent lifetime soil amendment. You add it once, it's there in the bed for life, then it just gets better as time goes on. And it not only holds microbes in those pore spaces, but it can hold water too. And you can just think of it like they're little reservoirs in the soil holding water for when the plant needs it, because all those little straws will fill up with water. It, you know, they can hold up to 20 times their, their weight in water. So biochar holds on to nutrients. It, it's a place a reservoir for water it's a home for beneficial biology and it just helps to build soil structure over time so absolutely amazing and you know biochar isn't charcoal right so you can't just like open up that bag of charcoal that you got for cooking on the grill and think that that's biochar because biochar you have to burn off all the flammable stuff and be left with just the carbon right when you buy charcoal from the store to cook on a lot of the flammable stuff is still there so that you have a nice long cooking time. Because if you lit that stuff and it burned through in 10 minutes, you know, you would not be happy, right? So there's a difference between charcoal and biochar and it's how it's made. It's the process, what temperature it's at, how long it's cooked for, when you stop it, how you stop it. All those things contribute to the quality of the biochar. Not all biochars are made equal, just like not all composts are made equal. Not all pizza is made equal. Not all beer is made equal. You know, it's, it's all about intent. And high-quality biochar is made with the intent to be biochar. Because there's some places that, you know, are burning wood chip for electricity, let's say. And when they're, they have a leftover byproduct and they say, oh, hey, wow, this is biochar. We can sell this now. Um, so it is kind of a little bit of um, buyer beware. You have to do your research. Look at the company that's uh, selling the product you know, and, and what information can they share with you about the product? Because some of the biochars in the market have a pH of 11. That is really high. That could hurt your plants if you mm -hmm. use too much of it. Okay. And so, you know, it's really about how it's made. And you can make it yourself at home on a home scale. It is not that difficult. You have to certainly take some safety precautions into account. There's tons of videos on YouTube about making your own biochar. You know, I have a whole section on it in the book talking about it. You know, on a home scale, you can make, it doesn't make a lot, you know, and so for your time and energy, it does take quite a bit to make it, but hey, if that's your thing and you want to make it, by all means, like, you know, have at, because you're putting carbon in your soil that's essentially now sequestered there permanently. And when you do it right and you have dry materials that you're turning into biochar, believe it or not, I've seen these systems, there's very little smoke that comes off because the biochar system will actually burn the smoke as an energy source. So you'll drive off a lot of moisture if there's any left, but the really good biochar making systems will actually use that smoke as a secondary energy source. So it's not polluting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere just for making biochar. Very interesting. What do you tell people who are starting their seeds indoors and thinking, 
Hmm, how would an organic gardener approach this? Are there some tips that you have? That's a great question. For seeds starting indoors, starting with a fresh or clean you know, seed tray is one of the most important things, right? So if you reuse uh, like a plastic seed tray each year, you definitely want to make sure that all the old soil has been removed from that seed tray and then it's been disinfected. And you can choose your favorite disinfectant. You can use hydrogen peroxide. You can use bleach, a 10 to 1 solution. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things you can use as a disinfectant. Um, but you want to make sure that you do treat that whole tray so that if there are any uh, random pathogens present from the prior year, um, that, you know, we can't see them. They're kind of oblivious to the naked eye. You'd know if plants were dying in that tray, then you, you might. And that's yet another reason why you should sterilize. But so that's important, starting with clean trays. You know, even if you're using something like an eggshell carton or something, you're recycling, you know, yogurt cups, that kind of thing, you know, more power to you you still want to make sure those things are really clean before you use them because you might lose some seeds as a result of not having clean materials. But past that, get yourself a seed starting blend, a, a blend that's designed for seeds because you're going to have more success that way. Just pretty simple tip there. And then, um, you know, get yourself a seedling heat mat, especially if you're in kind of a cooler area. The heat mat goes underneath the tray and it provides a gentle warming to help spur those seedlings to germinate faster. If you're doing this at home and not in a greenhouse type conditions, you know, humidity is important. So if you're doing it in your basement with lights, you want to make sure you have some kind of humidifier or humidity down there. You can use a dome over top of the tray to help up the humidity. You know, I've seen people get creative with chopsticks and plastic bags. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do for that. We want to just make sure that it's a little humid because seedlings are tender. They can dry out fast if the air is very dry in a winter setting in a home because, you know, our homes are being heated and they're generally pretty dry this time of year. And also the cells can dry out fast because generally you're starting these things in pretty small cells. So that's important. And then also if you're starting them inside, it's a very good idea to have an oscillating fan. It doesn't have to be big and powerful. It can be small and gentle. But an oscillating fan on little seedlings after they're up and they've thrown out their first true leaf a gentle oscillating fan will help prepare them for the great outdoors. When plants are moving with wind, they're starting to produce more compounds that help them deal with stress. And so that will help the plant when it gets out in nature. Because in your basement, there's generally no pests or any other problems to the plant. So it doesn't have a reason to produce these compounds to help it become more hardy. So that's important as well. And then when you finally are taking those little seedlings outside, well, I suppose I should also say, you want to make sure you're starting them well in advance. So read your seed packets, know how early you should be starting them inside based on your last frost date. So, you know, tomatoes, peppers, a, a lot of people will start those even around now uh, if they're not planting them until, you know, mid-May. It's good to do that because you're going to have a much bigger, healthier, robust plant. And in some places you absolutely need that, especially if you have a short summer. Question for you about worm castings. This is something that another listener had asked about Many organic gardeners say that they're an absolute necessity for growing high-quality produce. What are your thoughts on incorporating more worm castings into an organic garden? Yeah, so I mean, I think worm castings are a great organic fertilizer. You know, at, at this point, so worms in North America, you know, technically, we didn't have a high population of worms after the last ice age. But over time, you know, Europeans brought plants over, and with those plants, came root balls. With those root balls came worms. And as time goes on, worms have spread throughout most of North America. We know them as night crawlers. There, there's other species of worms that have come in since then. In some places, you know, worms are a pest, right? So I know you're from Minnesota, and I know there's been a lot of work done on the woods of Minnesota. And, you know, if you like to go fishing, I would encourage you, do not dump the worms out when you're done. I know you think you're just feeding the fish, but that can contribute to the degradation of an ecosystem because some of these worms will survive in the winter by burrowing down and getting below the frost layers. And then they come back up to the surface in, or in spring and they're eating the duff layer out of our forests, which is not good because then it changes the dynamic of the microbes in the forest, which can change the dynamics of how seeds germinate. And that's a much bigger issue. I don't recommend, you know, letting worms out into the wild, but, you know, worm castings, like the castings that we use, they're screened. So all those worms 
and the worm eggs, the cocoons, we don't get those in our castings. So good castings don't have any of that stuff in it. Those are saved back at the farm to make more worm castings. But castings themselves are a phenomenal soil amendment. It's like nature's perfect fertilizer. The worm is concentrating nutrients in the soil into the pellets it's leaving behind, the castings, the, the worm poop, right? It's full of biology. And the nutrient content in a casting is a lot higher concentration than in the surrounding soil. So I love them as fertilizer. I think they're one of the best things you can add to an organic garden, especially when you talk about growing edibles. They're low dose. They smell nice and earthy. So a lot of organic fertilizers don't smell that great, you know, fish emulsion or things like that. Whereas worm casting has a nice earthy smell to it. So it's fantastic for houseplants because you can just sprinkle some on top, give your plants a little boost. You can make a, a worm casting extract by mixing uh, worm castings, like a pound of castings, to a gallon of water. If you have well water, you don't have to worry about it. If you have city water, you got to let that gallon sit for a little bit out in the sun so that all the chlorine can off-gas because you don't want to chlorine with worm castings. Even at that low rate, it'll kill off some of the beneficial biology. So just give it a little bit outside, and all that will dissipate, and then you can mix it. But a gallon of water to a pound of worm castings, you mix it up. It turns so dark you can't even see through it. Hmm. But then if you go do something in the garden and come back to it, you know, half hour later or whatever, the castings will have settled into the bottom of the container, much like coffee grounds. And you can pour off the liquid fraction of the, the casting extract. And then you can duplicate it again with more water. And you can do it a few times before it starts to get pretty pale. And then you just kind of swish all those castings around and dump it out on your favorite plant. So you, you don't want to save the castings in the container and do it again the next day. You have to do fresh castings again if you want to do that. Okay. Well, that's useful information. You know, one of the last chapters in your book has to do with having an organic lawn. So if there are people that are thinking about changing their old lawn to an organic lawn this year... What advice do you have for them? Is that even possible to have a good-looking organic lawn? It's very possible to have a good-looking organic lawn. There's a ton of them out there. Um, organic lawn care is, there is a transition period, for sure, um, because it depends on how much time, and energy, and quite honestly, money you want to throw at it to convert it to an organic lawn. Did you say there was a transition period? Yeah, just because, you know, I've seen many organic lawns that look gorgeous longer into the season because they don't have a high salt content, which just tends to make lawns go brown faster in the middle of summer. So if you have a healthy organic lawn, I've seen plenty of those last a lot longer in terms of the green, the vitality, you'll, you'll have that. But it takes time to get there, right? You can't just switch over one year and think I'm automatically going to have a much better looking lawn later because it's organic and not conventional anymore. Um, you can uh, if you throw a lot of money at it, but most of us, that's not really practical. You know, if you're uh, a university, for example, well, you could do that. It's totally possible. But if you're just, you know, if you're a homeowner wanting to make the change, there's going to be some steps involved. And, and every year it will start to look better if you follow all the tenets of organic lawn care, right? You know, simple ones are like mowing at the right height, okay? Meaning you want to have like a three to four inch grass blade height in most grasses. Now, some of they're smaller just because they're smaller grasses. And then the blades don't even get that big, depending on where you are in the country. And there's cool season areas and warm season areas, and that'll impact, you know, what grass you can grow. But leaving the grass tall does a number of things. It helps shade the other blades of grass so they're losing less water, you know, healthier conditions. It's shading out weed seeds. And, you know, when you crop the uh, grass, and I get it, I was guilty of it when I was, you know, mowing the lawn as a kid. I'd crop it as low as possible thinking I'll have to mow less if I, if I cut off more. I won't have to do this again next week. And so then you run the risk of like hurting the crowns, which can then open up disease pressure. And, you know, with a lot of places, so take a golf course, for example, right? Most golf courses are not organic at all, but there are some that, that are organic. But at the same time, if they have an issue, you know, brown spot, whatever it is, they're going to take action immediately. They're going to spray a fungicide to kill that nest. In the organically managed golf courses, they then will come in after that with a kind of like a probiotic spray. Hey, let's put the good microbes back. We know we kind of killed a whole bunch of the fungus off because we had to kill this, this bad actor here, but let's put some good stuff back. 
right? So you can take that approach when you do things. But lawns in general need a lot of things that most of us don't give them. And so that's a cultural practice that kind of lead to a healthy lawn, which is just kind of practical gardening. And it just so happens it's organic. Like lawns every once in a while need to be dethatched, especially if you don't have a lot of microbial activity in that soil because the microbial activity will eat the thatch. And thatch is a buildup that basically doesn't allow water to penetrate very easily and can lead to other fungal diseases. So you have to dethatch your lawn. Sometimes it's good to aerate by plug aeration. It's a machine that goes lawn and pulls out little plugs. Because then you can add things after you plug, aerate, then you can add like a compost, uh, a light layer of that to get some good beneficial biology down to the soil, organic matter in the soil to help hold nutrients, hold water. So it's a process, but it's one of those things that you got to start somewhere. So there's plenty of other places, you know, if you look at places like, you know, Harvard and other schools that have on organic compost tea. You know, that's a whole other subject, but when made well, it contains a lot of beneficial biology, contains a fair amount of nitrogen. And so that's, you know, a way to treat your lawn. And there's a lot of organic land care companies out there now that can treat your lawn organically, products that have been developed specifically for turf care that are organic. So it's not impossible. It's absolutely doable. There's some gorgeous universities and other lawns and homeowners that have switched to organic and they have, they're much happier with it just because you have a greener space longer and then you don't have to feel bad for one second about you walking in a barefoot about your kids walking in a barefoot the, the grandkids your neighbor's kids your pets whoever right so it absolutely can be done um, it just takes a little bit of a different approach now what's one of the first things you would do for folks this spring that want to give it a try is there a product you would buy is there something you would say stock up on this and then apply this it will help you get going this spring so I would say the, the first thing to do would be to identify what grass you have and to identify, do you only have one type of grass or was it a mix that got put in, right? Um, because sometimes it's just about you can just overseed with an appropriate grass for your area and for the amount of light that you have, and that will help your lawn in a big way. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing I, you can do is cancel your membership with a chemical-based company if that's how you're managing your lawn. And then you know go to your local garden center. And there's a couple different manufacturers of these four-step programs, organic maintenance for lawns. And they're absolutely good programs. You know, there's in, in the horticulture world, there's a lot of diversity with jobs. But when I was going to the University of Florida, we call them turfies because these are the men and women that studied turf grass. It's a whole division. So fertilizers are designed specifically for grass. And it's going to provide the right amount of nutrients at the right time for overall healthy growth. And that's good because it just it makes it easier. Like you don't have to do all the research and think about it. You know, there, there are companies that have gone to making these four-step organic uh, fertilizers. For example, in the Minnesota area, there's a company called Sustain. And they make this four-step organic fertilizer program for turf. It's just super easy to use. Okay, put this one down in March, put this one down in May, put this one down in August, put that one down in you know October. I forget the exact dates, but you get my point here is that it makes it very easy. So from a nutrition set side, that's, a, that's an easy no-brainer to do. Just cancel the service you have or use up the products that you have and then make the switch. Got it. Um, but finding the right grass, that's important because, hey, if, if, if it's kind of thin and you're concerned about it, well, you know, just find out what grass does good in your area. And you can do that by doing your own research or going to the garden center. They're going to have a good answer for you. So there's that. Also, you want to water at the right times of day. That's really important on a lawn. Um, if you're watering at the wrong time of day, you can be encouraging poor growth or you can be encouraging fungal disease. So lawns are best watered. Early in the morning um, is, is honestly the best time to water your lawn. So if you have a sprinkler system, you know, set that irrigation to, to run maybe even before the sun comes up, right? Um, but definitely before like 9 or 10 a.m., like before everything's getting hot. Because the hotter it gets, the harder it is for the soil to accept water. So watering at the right time is important. So for me, an organic lawn, a green lawn, okay, and what I mean by that is if there's clover in my lawn, I'm a happy camper, okay? Because clover, number one, 
ex- it's fixing free nitrogen out of the air and providing that to the root zone area. Clover is going to bloom early and provide some pollen, early pollen for insects looking for that, right? And everyone's on board to support pollinators these days. That's another good way to do it. You know, clover used to be in every pasture mix, every grass mix, until a certain point in whenever the 70s or something, where everyone was like, no, only pure grass species. We need to have one uniform monoculture of grass across the the landscape. So it's a paradigm to say, you know what, look, as long as my lawn is green, I'm cool with that. So if there's a little bit of clover, maybe some other random species that aren't necessarily grass, as long as it's not taking over an area, then I'm, I'm cool with the occasional plantain or anything else in the grass. Like, it's, as far as I'm concerned, that's okay. But I know to each their own, but that's what I'm saying. There are plenty of grass species out there that are specific to the region of country that you live in. You know, one example is like this eco mix, which is a blend of different fescues. And fescues are pretty tough. This eco mix that you can find, I think it's Wildflower Farm that makes it. These fescues are so tough, they don't grow really fast. So you actually have to mow them less. And then they do better with less inputs. So you don't need to fertilize as much. And, and they're tough, so they can deal with water. And anyway, so th- there are some things you can do as far as, you know, going organic in year one. And it'll just get better with time. You know, the soil will get better and then the grass will stay healthier longer when the season gets hot. Your last chapter has to do with the consumerism and the consumption that we all battle every day. I thought the last paragraph, your final word, was just so good. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading that. And then let's talk about that, just in general, some of your thoughts on that. Sure. So, uh, you know, in my opinion, at at the heart of the organic philosophy is this devoted effort to use everything you have on hand and at home before heading out to buy more. You know, you you can propagate your own plants. You can collect your own seeds to sow the following year. You can divide existing plants to increase the size of your garden. You can trade those plants with friends, which is sharing the wealth and dishing out plants. And it gives each gardener new plants to enjoy, and all the while you're not spending a penny on new things. Uh, Plus, you get to practice a new skill, propagation, right? Just to ad-lib for a second, I was reminded yet again this winter how amazing plants are and how many plants will just root if you just take a cutting and stick it in water. Plants are so cool. Right. And, and there's I, I'm propagating all kinds of things. I was like, I just tried a whole bunch of cuttings. and I was like, wow, that rooted. Wow, that rooted. And these are going to be free plants in the spring. Anyway, sorry, it's a tangent. But. So growing your own herbs and veggies, that's also part of the movement to reduce consumption at the store. It saves you money and it's incredibly satisfying to eat the fruits of your garden labor. Herbs are also a perennial way to reduce the grocery store consumption all the while saving landfills and recycling bins from all that plastic packaging. Plus, if you grow your own herbs, they're fresh and available 365 days a year when you need them. Having parsley or rosemary growing outside on Thanksgiving Day when you realize you've forgotten it at the store is priceless. And whether you're reducing, reusing, repurposing, or recycling, by skipping buying something new, you help to reduce overall consumption and lessen your impact on the planet. Part of the organic paradigm is to do no harm on the planet on which we all live so that the earth can sustain us for as long as possible. Thank you. That's really the message of your book. Right. That, you know, organic gardening is awesome. It's very gratifying. You know, you can feel good about it at the end of the day. And it is about you know, lessening our impact on the planet so that the next 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, you know, life can continue as long as we figure out a few key things <laughs> <laughs> that are a little bit bigger than the organic gardening world. But, you know, in general, right, this heart of the, the philosophy, the paradigm shift is kind of, you know, make and do with what you have and basically kind of consume less and produce more and using nature for all of her strengths you don't necessarily have to run out and buy something to deal with something when maybe nature's going to just come along and take care of it for you. Well said. 
Well, Mark Highland, I appreciate you coming back on the show. It was a thrill to talk to you about your company and now to talk to you about your book, Practical Organic Gardening, The No-Nonsense Guide to Growing Naturally. Thank you for being on the show today. You bet. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Well, that's it for our show today on Practical Organic Gardening Explained, plus how to solve garden challenges naturally with Mark Highland. I hope today's show gave you a better understanding of organic gardening and reinforced a desire to set aside fertilizers and pesticides and focus on building healthy soil, creating a microbial haven by adding organic matter through compost. Just a reminder that the show notes for this episode will be under the Still Growing Podcast page over at my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. I'm so thankful to my team over at Podfly Productions, my editor and project manager, Eric Begay, and my copywriter, Ein Kadina. I'd also like to thank the women who make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Beth Gardens in Illinois. She works at Griffin, a national brokerage firm, and one of the finest companies in horticultural service. And Beth is also a board member of the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi, Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine. Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager over at American Beauty's Native Plants. And she was featured back in episode 553, where we talked all about incorporating more native plants into the landscape. Finally, A big thank you to today's sponsor, Cobra Head. For my sign-off today, I leave you with this thought to help you grow. How can you improve the soil in your garden? Start your garden adventure this spring by conducting a soil test. Commit to stopping the use of fertilizers and pesticides. Add organic matter instead. And look for earthworms. When you see earthworms, you can be sure that microbial life is alive and well in your garden. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. 